Thank you for your time. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for your timeliness. Um, we will now begin panel one, Technological Innovation in Asia part one. This panel is moderated by Dr. Kathleen Clayton, the associate, an associate professor and the chair of the University of Hawaii at Manoa's Asian Studies Program. She will be introducing our panelists. And as a quick reminder, please type all questions into the chat. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Clayton. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Um, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure and honor to moderate the first panel of this conference. Um, and it seems to me that this panel um, exemplifies the strengths of an interdisciplinary approach to the question of technology in Asia, as well as the benefits of an online event. Uh, we have four quite different papers by graduate students from four different disciplines and three far-flung universities on two continents and an island chain. Um, and they're all examining different ways in which technology is transforming lives in Asia and beyond. So I'll in briefly introduce um, all the speakers up front um, and then we'll get started with the first speaker. So our four speakers today are um, Justin Tian, you want to wave and say hello, uh, from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, who will be presenting a paper entitled From 2333 to AWSL, Language Used Online in Mandarin Chinese, um, which sounds fascinating since two, three, well, anyway, AWSL doesn't sound like Mandarin, any Mandarin that I know, but. Um, our, after that, our next speakers, speakers will be Sola Halwani and Gali Priambada from Paramadina University in Jakarta, Indonesia. Their paper is entitled Network Analysis in Digital Diplomatic Relations, Seen Through Open Source Intelligence Performed by Southeast Asian Actors. Our third speaker will be Vanessa Xiaowantai, um, a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania who will be speaking on the internet and the pas de deux of fiction writing, the formation of new classics and the extradition of literary methods. And last but not least is our own Jacob Evans Wong, a graduate student in our um, universe, um, University of Hawaii at Manoa Asian Studies program, who will take us into the lunch break with a talk entitled Food Tech Innovations in Southeast Asia. Wow, that's a lot of food. Um, so each speaker or pair of speakers will speak for 15 minutes. Um, I think, so if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. If there are quick kind of clarification questions, maybe I'll ask the speakers to um, respond briefly um, after their talk, but let's keep the sort of deeper um, questions and discussion for the end. We'll have about 15 minutes at the end for, for discussion. So without further ado, I, it is my pleasure to introduce Jiaxin Tian. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, can you see that? Okay. Yes. Um, then I will start. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jiaxin Tian. I'm a PhD student in the East Asian Languages and Literatures at UHM. And today I'm going to report my study entitled From 2333 to AWSL, Language Used Online in Mandarin Chinese. Um, and I will present in this order. Um, so you know that there are over 1 billion people accessing to the internet in China and language used online has emerged substantially and has become a linguistic product shared by the masses. And how digital communication technologies are affecting languages has exacted considerable speculations and inspired a growing body of scholarship in Chinese. While we don't have a, a a study as comprehensive as hearings from the traditional linguistic lens to categorize nice speak. Therefore, to fill this gap, this study aims to um, uh, this study aims to uh, first to describe the patterns of Chinese nice speak by employing hearings framework, and then analyze the salient features of Chinese speak and its motivations. And I hope this study can shed light on the relative comprehensive understanding of Chinese nice speak. Um, there are many terms trying to capture the linguistic phenomenon online, such as computer mediate, uh, mediated communication as CMC, NetSpeak, ChatSpeak, and so on and so forth. Also, personally, they are all being criticized for not being accurate. But this is not the focus of this study, so we I just use the NetSpeak as a notational convenience and defined as a type of language displaying features that are unique to the internet and encountered in all of the internet-based situations arising out of its characters as the medium which is electronic, global, and interactive. In Chinese, we have four similar terms, and you can tell from its translations that the 
网络流行语 popular word used online and 网络用语 word used online are most relevant in this study. However, the last one, 网络热词 this one is not because they are just words reflecting some major social a、uh, soldier a、uh, social events and is popular used on social media and daily life. And it usually does not present any distinguishable features of language、uh, online. For example, pandemic is a 网络热词 in 2020, but、uh, it is obviously not a word that has a feature that is unique to the internet. So therefore, this too will be implied to search related scholarship in Chinese. And there are many studies on categorizing Chinese Nazpeak from different perspective, but one problem with those studies are lacking their ambiguous or lack of definitions of Nazpeak. So, for example, many study analysis. Analysis data、uh, from top ten words of the year published by a journal called Yao Wen Jiao Zi. So, yet the main editor of this journal said that the top ten words of the year should reflect the, the major social events, promote positive attitudes, and guide language usage. And therefore, clearly, they are not appropriate in the study. Uh, one illuminating study for this research is here in 2019. She comprehensively delineated the. Features of English not speak according to the traditional hierarchy of grammatical phenomena in linguistics, from the macro levels of typography and orthography through the、uh, morphology at, at the word level to syntax at the utterance level, which is illustrated in this table. And for the sake of time, I will not elaborate it, but I just want I just want to mention several points. So for the typography, it refers to Ah,、uh, the visual presentation and the orthography it is co-occurs with typography usually, but it emphasizes spelling more. And morphology, this is emphasizes、uh, the emergence of the productive word formatives and the outcomes of word formation process. And the last one, syntax of English not speak is mainly concerned with the violation to the standard grammar. And the data of Uh, this research is mainly collected from Baidu Feidian, Bilibili Year End Summary, and Chinese End Nasslan and Wikipedia. So Bilibili is a popular、uh, a popular video sharing website in China with the distinguishing feature of a real time captioning system called Bully Comments, and it also published、uh, frequently used Bully Comments every year since 2017. So given the data that I collected, I attempt to answer the following questions. What are the structural characteristics of Chinese not speak, and what are some features, and what motivates those features? And here is a summary of my analysis. And first of all, I want to say that Chinese is type、uh, typologically different from English and applies a distinguished writing system, and that's the categories here are not identical to hearings. For example, the non-standard capitalization is not a. Applicable in Chinese, and I also added three more here, and I will elaborate them one by one. So first, as you see in my title, the first type is the typography, and here are some examples. So for the first one, is also show in my title. So that is two, three, three. Actually, this is a popular word meaning laughter, and it was not relevant to the sounds or form. Of Arabic numbers to、uh, two and three, but came from an online forum that the two hundred and thirty third image code was a laughing cat, and it could be elongated by adding the number three. And the longer the number is, the more intensive the feeling is. And the second one is the left parenthesis. I found this is very interesting because it, first it is usually found at the end of the sentence, and it has two functions. The first one is to indicate actions via performative practice. Predicates such as facial expressions like plus xiao after the left parenthesis and laughter. That means laughter. And the second function is to med mitigate face threatening actions. So, like in this example, the 不是 after the left parenthesis actually negates the previous sentence to avoid misunderstanding between the interlocutors and make the joke clearer. Um, this this type is similar in English and third one U one S one. This is come from a Chinese word. Yu yi shuo yi means to tell you the truth, and you can see that the Arabic one substitute the Chinese characters one. And the last one five five five. Actually, this is just indicates crying because the sound of five、uh, in Chinese is similar to the sound of crying. The second type is、uh, orthography. And you can see there are several subcategories here. The first one is the loosened norms, and it could be further presented in three types. And the first one is to use the radical of a character to represent the whole characters, and that's the、uh, example. 
example, and this one is not as much as the other two because it requires the name of the radical uh, should be aligned with the character. And the second one is to separate the components of the characters to indicate emphasize, similar to the function of the capitalization in English. So for example, yue ban, um, it is an example to, that to denotes pang, that means fat, to convey the meaning of fat vividly. And due to the horizontal reading directions, characters in left to right structures are preferred in this way. And third one is, um, is to formulate a new meaning characters with several uh, components. The characters usually existed before, but they gain new meanings through this process. So how is an example? It's the original meaning is a moat. Well, in the Chinese in that context, it refers to right, uh, rich redneck. And the example of Chinese and English combination is da ke bu bi. So it's from the Chinese word totally unnecessary da so you can see that in this case, the meaning of this word has nothing to do with dark in English or Chinese, but it's evident that the dark in English has a similar pronunciation of dark in Chinese. And next one is the stylization. So stylization refers to the accent imitations, um, which are usually manifested in the creation usage of Chinese characters, the characters only denote the pronunciation, not the meaning. So the first one is the dialect stylization. So the first one, this is a Guangxi accent of feel, feel bad and want to cry. And this one, nei, is an I dialect stylization because the nei is the vernacular, vernacular pronunciation of na. And also we can see a lot of foreign language stylizations from English, Japanese, and Korean. And also we do have counterparts in representation of prosody, but the difference is, it, is that we can present them in characters or in pinyin. And third type is morphology. So for the first type, uh, first subcategory is initialism. We have three of them. So first we can um, initial, the first one is the initial of each uh, Chinese words. For example, ye qing hui means uh, literally means grandpa uh, youth back, which is a abbreviation of the ye de qing chun hui lai le. Grandpa's youth came back to describe the situations from the past reappears and which bring up people's old reminiscence. And the other one is initialism of pinyin, AWSL. So this is a top one book comments in 2019, which is a pinyin initial of ah, was the, oh, I'm dying. So to express that something is really good. And since pinyin is not as parent as characters in Chinese, the pinyin initialism should use the first letter of every characters in that phrase. And third one is abbreviation of English words, but it applies a different uh, English initialism. For example, the nobody cares can be short as NBCS in Chinese. And then the semantic shift indicates the meaning of some words has been changed in the internet context. So Zhenxiang, the original meaning is to describe the food is delicious. However, online, it means that uh, someone to describe someone doing something they had previously sworn never to do. And Taowa is, uh, is a change of the part of speech. So Taowa actually is means uh, decreasing size doors uh, one place inside another, which actually is a noun. However, in the online tech context, it can be used as a verb uh, in Jinzhi Taowa. It means stop repeating or forbid repeating. And the last one is word borrowing. So we just borrow uh, some words from other languages. And this one is different from stylization. For stylization, we usually present present them in Chinese characters, but for this one, we just present in its original spelling. And the last one is syntax. So we do have some violations to the standard forms in Chinese not speak. One of the example is 我也, which means me too. So actually it is ungrammatical uh, to say 我也 because you have to, 我也 itself cannot stand alone. It should be followed by a predicate to indicate a shared sit, uh, situation or feelings, but it is legitimate and widely used online. And so after describing the structural characters of Chinese not speak, let's take a look at some silly features of them. So you may have some expressions that um, and unique how uh, the unique writing system, the Chinese characters and pinyin play essential and silly roles in the features of Chinese not speak. So um, Chinese characters are widely acknowledged as ideographic, specifically the form of the characters is related to the meaning uh, rather than the sound. So the, this property is further amplified in Chinese not speak, exemplified in the subject, uh, subcategory of loose norms in the orthography. And also 
at the same time, Chinese characters online tend to be on the track of having more phonetic features. Namely, the characters are only related to the song and have nothing to do with the meaning, which is mainly manifested in the stylization. So, and also Pinyin, on the other hand, as an official romanization system for standard Mandarin Chinese in mainland China, it has been an indispensable uh, tool in denoting the pronunciation of Chinese characters. The usage of Pinyin can only be found in the initialism, uh, so it seems that the role of Pinyin is is not as salient as Chinese characters informing uh, net speak. However, the interconversion of Chinese characters and pinyin can produce a large of number of variants because there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the characters and pinyin. So one pinyin combination can correspond to many characters. And let's take AWSL as an example. So it is started actually with correct characters, which is awasila, and then abbreviate. I'm sorry. And then abbreviate with the uh, PE initials AWSL. And then some other uh, phrases came up with the same initials like AWSL. And then some uh, resulting complements are uh, joined in this word formation to form a new one. And you can see that the later developed phrases, uh, the characters in later developed phrases have nothing to do with the original meaning. And the motivation for the popular tendency of using Chinese characters. Uh, and rich variants can be encapsulated by the inbetweenness and the playfulness. So the inbetweenness refers to the NASPIC is in the interface of writing and speaking. That is to say NASPIC is unimodal and specifically in written form. It should be acknowledged that the technology, uh, technological affordance such as FaceTime, Zoom, live stream are available to have multimodal communication. However, we usually communicate communicate online with each other via writing. In that case, it is difficult for the online interlocutors to get their feelings across with intonations, facial expressions, and gestures. And thus, we can draw support from the ideographic property of characters to highlight the particular things virally. And on the other hand, the simulation of speaking in real time of the net speak to some extent motivated them to make characters to indicate phonetic features. And also the typing system of Chinese also play a role in this tendency. So we have two keyboards in typing Chinese, regardless of the type of the keyboard, one has to select the correct Chinese characters after typing pinyin, as shown in this figure. And to save time uh, in synchronous chatting or make silent uh, instant bullet comments while watching uh, videos, netizens prefer to type the initials of pinyin and automatically choose the default characters that usually appear at the first place. And someone had pointed out that now we have predictive spelling and speech to text software to reduce the frequency to non standard orthography and topography, but many netizens still generate non standard forms because they intend to be playful and creative. And using stylization and initialism, uh, the netizens can create it, uh, the inclusiveness of in group and the exclusiveness of out of group. And here is a brief summary, and I should make it clear that it is impossible to examine each piece of the next peak, so the data is just a necessarily representative, and it could be further examined by uh, incorporating more recent data. And that's my reference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Wow. Just under the wire there on the, on the timing. Great job, Jiaxin. Um, that's totally fascinating. And makes it even more impossible to think about will I ever learn Chinese well enough to be able to communicate? Um, next up, uh, we have Solehal Wani and Gali Priambada from Paramedina University. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, we're here. One okay. second. Can see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Hold on. Let's, um, okay, we can start it. Um, am I audible as well? Yes, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, 
Thank you, moderator, and thank you, everybody, for the time and the virtual stage for us. And here we are uh, presenting our research paper entitled a network analysis in digital diplomatic relations in true open source intelligence performed by Southeast Asian actors. With me, uh, Soleh Halwani and my colleague Gali Priyambada from Paramedina Graduate School of Diplomacy in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. And basically, this is just us. So I just move to the next slide and so what to travel on this uh, presentation that we put it into four different stages. Uh, the, the first is the state actors in Southeast Asia. The second is theory and methodology. The third is visualization analysis. And the, the last one is conclusion, which also include recommendation. And before we go in, into deeper discussion, we just would like to briefly discuss about the brief of this uh, uh, research. So we will just... Um, describe a brief about the brief. So we we're going to discuss about the digital diplomacy. So we're here, we define digital diplomacy here is to network foreign policies, politics, and affairs. Where this to uh, enlarge on the an approach using open source intelligence or in short OSIN in the land of digital media or in specifically social media. And this is to aim for, uh, to see the network leadership in Twitter where it is used as a mini block, or some people also uh, some people call it diplomacy, where many political actors and state and non-state actors are communicating to one another. And then let's go back on the digital diplomacy. So under here we have the actors who are doing the the diplomacy itself. So the actors are uh, are are objective, going to have listen and engage with their audiences. So to further uh, examine uh, what is listen and engage here, we put it in formulation, uh, formulating, predicting, implementing, identifying, and influencing the policy. And then this all for the actors to aim for having diplomatic excellence for this is uh, to reflect the, the actors, both state or non-state actor, to achieve their national goals. And about the brief where we will be standing on this research paper, since we're in Indonesia, so we're, we're uh, we will be uh, taking side uh, from the perspective of Indonesia. So for, for short uh, description about Indonesia, maybe some of you have not heard of it or, or just a bit, or, but uh, not so sure which one. So we'll just explain it a bit. So Indonesia is uh, located in Southeast Asia region where we have uh, seven, uh, 17,000 island, making us the, the world largest countries. And we have, we also have the population of 200, uh, 270 million people, making us the world for most populous country. And we uh, speak 700 languages spoken in the country. And this is the Southeast Asia. So this is the region. So in the, the uh, uh, green color, it's Indonesia. So in Southeast Asia, there are 11 countries. And this is us in the map. This is us in the globe and this is on the map. Then, uh, so Indonesia is almost half of the entire region. And jumping into the literary review. So we have a four layer foundation of uh, theory here. The first one is soft, uh, soft power where we taking Joseph Ney to state it about the soft power where it is said that uh, soft power of a country is identically dependent on identity as is felt by other people. And then the second layer would be a constructivism where we taking uh, Alexander on uh, uh, Alexander Wen and then Onof as well, where they argue that socio, uh, a society uh, so, a social uh, constructions of social connection is made by ideas, a society actually made by ideas. So the identity uh, connected constructivism is made by ideas. And then in further about the digital diplomacy, here we've taken a couple of uh, theories are stating that digital diplomacy does not bring dr uh, drastic uh, differences on terms of function, but only in terms of uh, new forms of diplomacy that influence its practices. And bring further onto the fourth layer, we have uh, ad hoc network theory by Bruno Latour, 
he stated that uh, social actors do not define um, the actor based on social order, but rather focus on the actor's connections. And there are line one another, both if they are connected and non-connected within the networks. And then about the actor itself, so we have 11 actors here, both state and non-state actor, including uh, institutions. And with this uh, actors, we have a research limitation uh, to make it uh, more uh, uh, significant to the limitation. So we divide it into four limitations. The first is the actor itself. Uh, the, the actor we're not taking from all actors from embassies and uh, institutions, both for Indonesia and to Indonesia in Southeast Asia. And then the second is about the time. The crawling data were only done in one day with the oldest data in 4 January, 2022. And then the latest data would be 20, 20, uh, 27 January, 2022. So this is really new research. Uh, however, in short uh, period time. And then the third is about the data. So the data were taken from Twitter using Twitter API in Twitter developer which only containing about direct tweets, retweets, and mention. And then the last part would be about the tools. So we were crawling the data using Microsoft Excel and then analyze and having it visualized using Giphy uh, tools. So in short about the diplomacy, uh, we go to the, on the picture here. So diplomacy is actually the combination of traditional diplomacy, digital diplomacy as a cyberspace, and then Twitter as the platform. So there's a layer of this called diplomacy. So this is what we are going to uh, um, discuss this further. The next stop would be the methodology. So we were taking methodology uh, uh, formed by Professor Craswell about explore, exploratory sequential method design, where the data was taken from Twitter, which means that qualitative data collection. So the data is actually unstructured data and then builds and process using tool to make it into structured data, into quantitative data. And then the lastly about the interpretation. While the data acquisition method here is the same as uh, that we were explaining on the research limitation. And ladies and gentlemen, this is, is the result. On the left side, on the picture with the black background, here is the network visualization taken from Gephi and data processing. So you can see that a couple of elements that we would like to explain here. The first is the, 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 uh, the circle or the dots or the nodes here. This is called a nodes. Nodes represent the actor. This is the name of the actor. And then you can see also there is a line or wire here. This is called edges. So edges to represent network or relation. And also there are colors uh, among them. And here the bigger node have color of red, you can say that. And then there's also a color of blue and up here. This is to explain its actor has its own cluster. So to read this, so Pacmer has relation to Indonesia Hanoi, has relation to ASEAN, ASEAN is an institution, uh, the only institution in the region. It's called Association of South ASEAN Nation. And then there's also Kemlu RE. Kemlu RE is MOVA in Indonesia. And then Jokowi. Uh, Jokowi is our president, Mr. President Jokowi Dodo. And then so the Packerman has relation to all mostly significant and influential actors. So let's go to the left side. So here the Packerman and then ASEAN in the second and then Kang Kwan Vin. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly. And the, the cluster here, so Pang Wan uh, Vin is an ambassador, an ex-ambassador uh, for Vietnam to United States. And there's also Kaden Luis. So Kaden Luis is um, a social justice warrior activist. So he also built its own network. So however, in terms of a point of view of Indonesia, Indonesia are only appear bigger under the network of Packerman, which is Indonesia in Hanoi. So to describe further how it became like this. Um, oh yeah, so uh, before that, um, this is the visualization for the qualitative data. So data was taken from unstructured data or qualitative data, turned it into quantitative data. This is the quantitative data that proceeds in uh, Gavi. And then, for the next is about the KP network analysis. 
So in the Geffen network analysis, we are taking four, uh, sorry, five alg algorithms. There is a graph density, modularity, page rank, the pinna centrality, and weighted degree work. Is this is all about? We'll discuss it on the next slide. The first is graph density. The fun, uh, the the findings of uh, the first graph is that the graph density is to um, it's to uh, analyze network density in measuring its compactness or its relation. So how close is the relation R? The first one, unfortunately, that every uh, every actor will be uh, working according to their own interest. Does this is mean that the actors does not have mutual interest? That's what that's why the relation are not compact or in compactness. This is shown from the data 0 0.009. This means a far from one. So the data, if we, it's the graph density is one, that means have a perfect relation, but if it's far from one and then it's have a, a far relation to one another. And then the next about the nodes. So in the notes we have Packerman. Who, uh, who is a Cambodian journalist, uh, independent journalist who based in US. And why Packerman become the biggest notes in the, in the visualization, data visualization, because his tweeting of method are using by quote tweets to get notified by interested party and influencer parties. And then the narration, what are the, uh, the actors are mostly talking about on their ne network? So the narration, what we found is that there's a mixture. Uh, there's a mixture about uh, politics and social culture. So these two pillars actually are are part of ASEAN uh, narration to promote uh, in the regions, also to the globe. And then next stop for the modularity. So modularity is to uh, to analyze how many actor cluster or communities or within their network. So the first one about the cluster. So among the, uh, the, the visualization, we found that there are 25 cluster uh, within, the, within the network. This is to show that, um, this is to show that uh, the cluster uh, among the community, because the data quantitative data saying it's, uh, it's almost close to one, and then this means that communities are closely related. So the 25 cluster have their own communities and get them closer together. And then the other part would be the player. The first player is ASEAN, Pakaman, and Indonesia uh, Embassy in Phnom Penh. And then the, the other uh, bigger player in modularity to uh, to gain cluster and having uh, having them closer together is the uh, Wen Ling Hao, a Philippine ambassador to Indonesia. So uh, the Philippines are narrating their uh, interest and concern to Indonesia very well. So they keep uh, the the network closer. However, this would be uh, great for diplomacy if they are uh, expanding to another uh, actors, not only their circle. And then. Uh, this, the third one is about the page rank. So the page rank is its name. It's a, uh, the rank for their, uh, their, their page. So to analyze uh, level of interest. So page rank is to, to, to identify the level of interest and identify reference or sources. So if they have a higher page rank, so they can be the sources of uh, references within the network. So the first one about the references itself. So as we, as we see in the, Visualization Packmer has a higher rank. This means that his high, he, he has a high level of interest, which means that he has highest potential to be the storyteller to talk about any topic related to uh, his interest in the region. And then in terms of Indonesia, uh, official government uh, Actors from Indonesia, however, were not fine in the page rank. Uh, the page rank. This is um, very unfortunate for us, considering that Indonesia is the largest numbers in population with massive number of internet user, and also we have democracy bonus. But this is not uh, this is not seen in a digital diplomacy. So uh, we have a not so high level of interest on this page rank, and then ASEAN. Even ASEAN is uh, located in Indonesia. This is work uh, not according to Indonesian interest. So uh, ASEAN come out the second page rank. This means that 
ASEAN can have a merit, a demeration within the region for diplomatic interaction and to influence. And then the, uh, the fourth part is between a centrality. This is the notes for uh, to, to identify actors' importance. So the bottlenecks we have uh, those who have a uh, between the centrality is the bridge or the bottleneck of the information among the actors. And the key players will still uh, Fackerman, ASEAN, and Kamloop. This is Indonesia uh, uh, has the influence on only as a between a centrality, only the, the, the bridge of the information, not the main actors. And then for weighted degree, for we have a points here. So weighted degree is to analyze the number of relation. So the point here, um, if the, the actor has a higher point, that means that they are the core of the engagement within the network. And then the degree, uh, Pakmer again, Pakmer. So he supplies the information to grab the audience attentions and the interest here uh, to focus on their own interest. So there's no uh, unite, uh, unite uh, narration according to their, uh, uh, only according to their interest and concern. So, so Lahal, could I, could I just cut in? Um, your time is up. Can you take, oh, you're at your conclusion slide. Perfect. Yes. Why don't you just wrap up? Thank you. Yep. Yeah, on the conclusion, so we can say that digital interaction between actors is leading, uh, not leading less by Indonesia. So this is, uh, we encourage Indonesia to have more uh, communication in digital diplomacy. And also the key learning that we expect that SIA actors or Southeast Asia to expand more their network in order to narrate their uh, pillar of uh, digital diplomacy to take lead. So this is also to, to build up its identity and to promote a uh, position stronger in the region. As it's time is up, so yeah, this is just a brief uh, a recommendation for the um, a political actors and also the policymaker. And if, One. if the policymaker wants to have narration, who's to engage with this as the person, according to our research. And That'd be all from us. Terima kasih and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, is there any quick questions? If you have a quick kind of clarification question, you can pop it in the chat right now. Um, otherwise, we'll maybe hold the broader questions for the discussion period. All right, I don't see anything in the chat. So I will move on and introduce Vanessa Xiaowan Tsai from University of Pennsylvania. Take it away. So she is currently not here. Um, she's gonna come for the Q&A, but she sent us a recording. So Tasha's going to share a recording of her presentation. And then she does plan on being here for the Q&A. So if you okay. have any any questions that you that come up while you're watching her presentation, um, you can just write them down and then hopefully she'll be here for the Q&A and you can ask them then. Hang on one second. We're going to try to figure out the kinks with the sound. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's very happy to join this conference and share my some thoughts with you. So you can see my topic here. Like in East Asia, the relationship between the internet and the literature is undergoing significant changes and difficulties in terms of like the producers, the topics of production, audience, communication platforms, and methods or methodology, founders' attention, and academic research focus. And this is a critical subject such as um, such as the some stars in the Buddhism, and while new aspects have been added and blended in literature and on the internet, there are several distortions and new normal. There has been no comprehensive research conduct in this on this critical subject, 
Each piece of classical literature has a universe of meaning. However, in popular writing, this word of meaning has been depleted, leaving just a plot or two satisfying people's demands. It's possible to study like the online journal or the uh, internet literature by writing about the new historical theory and context. Why would the governments, which previously paid a little attention to the online literature, seek to utilize this as a platform for fresh political propaganda and the, the dissemination of so-called historical novels, as well as choose a novel with a proper subject for several online writing competitions? If the markets and readers are also primary considerations for creators, has a group of like Wuxia and BL or the power struggle novels, like, and the trend toward CB has detrimental effects on creators. In my presentation or in my paper, I will study many voices and attempt to identify a new normal in such a situation, a kind of open history. This is not a simplified a literacy examination, but also a sociological and tenuous uh, examination of the mass culture industry. Like only the scholars are likely to take parallels and constructs between internet literature and traditional literature seriously notice. This is not only because the network has evolved into infrastructure, and the reading screen has supplanted reading, but also because most people reading times is being consumed by new entertainment programs such as the short videos and the apps. So it is partially because the new entertainment programs like this have taken over most people's reading time. The ivory tower is still debating whether literacy is good for network or traditional, while the general populace outside the tour has long categorized the literature as traditional items. So following the packaging of the products, attentive packers must always compile a list and write down their nature, purpose, origins, and context, which is another chance for renaming the study. Some historical issues have been reopened, and one of the most serious issues in the history of online literature is that the term of internet literature now appears to have become the moniker of the online sharing fiction, whereas online literature referred to all texts created and published on internet novels when literature was just touching the internet. So when the internet was initially introduced to literature, Internet literature mean any materials generated and published on the internet, including like novels, poetry, essays, and other other categories. What happened to cause this shift? It is not difficult to establish conclusive answer for like the package history, and outcomes can always be traced and constructed from to find the proper seal in the dust of a time. But what if you are dealing with package that are always open and being updated? I'm afraid that title is made not that appropriate. It requires a type of open history. So the purpose of the open history is to identify the chance, the gap, and the possibility of fitting in things so that one may be more conscious about its potential like which is also future of source. So the emergency of Chinese internet literature is linked to the establishment of the new literature units. So however, however the emergency of network um, literature is not only the constructive literacy historical event, but also a deconstructive theoretical events, which has clearly opened up the process of tracing and to examine the people's concepts of leisure while fostering changes in the literary landscape. So um, people debate network leisure frequently in the network and the literacy on the two 
programs to write articles to determine who include who, who affects who, and like in the sealed history of network which um, so these objects are valid but if we regard these two elements as two points of view they might act to each other rather than um like connect of the solution so we will see that the network and the leisure are not mutually inclusive so the leisure and the network are really very uh, intervened so the most essential gift of the network or the internet is it connects everything, blurred the lines between the close and distance, high and low, and enabling individuals to better observe and participate in the world. So what about the term leisure? So like Marx Weber's observed, men as animals suspend in a verb of meaning constructed by himself. So it is a weak Greek it is, it is, yeah, it's a very great achievement. So it's necessary to have an unlimited interaction in order to uncover the uh, intricacy in every day to light a fire of hope on the top of the ruins and to continually discover creativity and to convert the deterioration into an instrument. So in order to, uh, in order to discover and create, to convert the deterioration into magic. So limitless connection and communication are required. Isn't this today's network? So literature is a particular institution, everything outside itself and everywhere and nothing is today's network. So, however, in order to, um, in order for the society to, um, yeah, to process and the culture to be developed, such as specialized place but be preserved while maintaining um, mainstream culture, there must be some relatively event grade persons or some relatively event grade settings whose members have a broader knowledge spectrum, more connective capacity and acute the emotion and who can engage in more complicated and deep human nature investigation. And it may become unmanageable if the initial niche in group research and freedom of human nature is taken to the outside in an unsuitable area and time. Can there be no niche or the market? Uh, this is a subject we typically miss. So in fact, um, masses of um, Miraculous, either of many types of nutrition, may well decrease if there isn't a specialty. So, niche area is generally a place of experimentation and trial and error, with 90% of startups following. For example, though a lot of specialized theory is banned, it is possible that certain some possibilities are retained at some time. To some degree exploration may be observed by outstanding popular theater or it may give rise to spline creations. So about the future, in this regard, I believe that are the, some advantages to grading or to the level to level management. One is the difficult grading of H and the other is the significant grading of interest establishment by the circle rules. For instance, if the three perspectives are similar and whether they share common knowledge base in general, there are certain things they need in each space and huge civilization cannot exist with only. So we can believe that each piece of classical literature contains, contains a universe of meaning, and the popular writing has emptied this meaning, leaving just the stories to humans' wants or appetites. Um, we would assume it was a question of story patterns. Mm, they warn me, though, like um, that dealing with emotions in a timely manner is critical. You have just 10 minutes to get my attention activity as a tree as a reader to raise a text. People on the other hand will select the most convenient manner to fulfill their wants. Formerly, it was um, the online reading today. 
it may be those the short videos in the app which can better satisfying emotions if this occurs um the focus of online literature must be shifted so this signifies the this pieces of line it's only worse and you're just a meal substitute until the main course arrives Great, thank you, Vanessa. You're here. Do you want to? Is there anything you want to add? No. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? Quick questions for Vanessa? Sort of clarification questions. Um, if not, we'll save the. As I said, save the deeper questions for the Q and A session. Anything in the chat coming up? All right. Then let's move on to last but not least. Um, Jacob Evans Wong, who will be speaking on food tech innovations in Southeast Asia. Wow, that's a lot of food. Hi, everyone. Um, just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen. Perfect. Hey, All right. All right. Hello. Hi, my name is Jacob Evans. Um, and today I want to be kind of doing an overview of food tech and how. South Asia is kind of becoming this hub of, of food tech innovation and a leader and a kind of a, a standard that's being set for the rest of the world. So first off, we have to answer what is food tech? So food tech, food tech is food technology. Um, it ranges from you know, 3D printing meat, uh, precision farming, applying the blockchain, to techno uh, blockchain chain technology uh, in order to reduce the amount of food waste along supply chains, but most basically, it's technology meant to augment means of food production. And so why is this important? So right now, we are currently struggling to meet our global food goals. Right now, around 768 million people are facing chronic hunger, so that's starvation level hunger. Um, but beyond that, if we expand this scope even more, um, even an even larger amount of people are being forced to compromise on the quality or quantity of, of uh, the food that they're consuming. And this actually affects a lot larger portion of the world. This affects about 2.37 billion people, about 33% of the global population. And it's not exclusive to Pacific regions. It's uh, found across the board in all regions, including here in Hawaii, for example. And uh, <clears throat> to compound that, um, this at-risk group of individuals is rapidly expanding and it's been compounded by the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the increased health safety measures that uh, governments have, have placed on people. So in 2021, we saw a sharp increase in domestic food price inflation, specifically in less developed countries, and it really affected people and their ability to get not only the quantity, but the quality of food that they need. So a lot of people were starting to replace their, um, their standard nutrition with cheap energy dense foods with very minimal nutritional value. And so what does it have to do with food tech? Well, I strongly believe that food tech provides the solution to a lot of the current problems we're having both with production and distribution because what we're doing right now isn't working. And what we're doing right now is not helping us progress towards our global food security goals of zero hunger and more specifically, more kind of in that short-term range, reducing the amount of people who are unable to get uh, proper amounts of nutritious food. So I chose to focus on Singapore and Southeast Asia uh, for two reasons. The first is a bit anecdotal, and it's because Singapore is really the crossroads of a lot of cultures. It's a, it's a foodie people. If you've seen Crazy Rich, Rich Asians, you know, food's a big emphasis in Singapore. And the second, uh, is because that's currently where the money's flowing right now. The Singapore government is encouraging a lot of investment. So a lot of companies are going to Singapore because of all the capital. And it's specifically because Singapore has this 30 by 30 economic plan. So currently Singapore imports about 90% of its food from over 170 different countries. And in order to strengthen their own food security, they've created this 30 by 30 economic plan, which has a goal of producing 30% um, of its own 
agri-food industry by the year 2030. And so why is Singapore doing this and how does it make it kind of this, this hub of food tech in Asia? Well, Singapore is a really small country. Um, it has very limited land and resources. Currently only 1% of Singapore is, is being used for farming and there isn't much room for, for more farming. So the, com so the government's really trying to put money into alternative ways of producing and distributing food. Um, and that's in turn created new policies that uh, are conducive for these alternative food productions, as well as bringing people into the country, companies and startups that are willing to work towards this. And this brings us to alternative proteins, kind of the main focus of uh, food technology for this presentation. So a main component of the 30 by 30 plan is the production of alternative protein sources. So alternative protein sources are any food or beverages that derive proteins from sources other than living animals. So we have, we have impossible meats that we're very familiar with here, um, but there's other things including, you know, mushroom, insect-based proteins, as well as cell cultures or lab-grown proteins. Singapore has created an economic environment that has been conducive to new startups focused on developing and marketing alternative proteins. And although Singapore's alternative proteins have primar primarily composed of plant-based proteins, up to this point, they're starting to introduce insect-based proteins and cell culture protein alternatives in order to continue pushing towards their 30 by 30 plan and uh, really create 30% or, or have, be able to have um, their own agri-food industry produce 30% of the food that they need. So I wanna start off with insect protein. So currently 2 billion people on the earth rely on insect protein um, and this is, not uncommon in Asia at all, but traditionally it's been more in developing areas and kind of has this negative stigma towards it. But countries like Singapore have started to see the need for insect protein. And the big thing that, the big draw towards insect protein is the amount of land required to, um, to develop this industry. So unlike uh, traditional protein sources like cows or pigs, insects have a higher feed conversion ratio, which means that the, uh, the amount of food required to produce one kilogram of, of these insects is significantly less than food required to create or to grow a kilogram worth of pork or, or cow. And what also appeals to them is that it can be achieved using food, uh, waste food from other sources. So it doesn't require a whole other industry necessarily to develop the feed for their livestock. They're able to use the waste from other industries and use it to uh, to grow their insect protein industry. And so really insect protein has become ideal for countries like Singapore, developed nations with limited resources and limited land um, because of its ability to be produced on such a large scale in such a small quantity of space. And so Singapore-based companies like Ultimate um, have already begun to create a market for insect protein sources. On this slide, you can see two of their best sellers. You have a peanut butter cinnamon bar and a double chocolate bar uh, made completely out of insect protein. And a lot of Singaporeans themselves see this as an ethical, environmentally friendly and social responsible product. Um, so these new products are really showing that insect protein can be appealing and that there's a market for it as well. And it's really poised to contribute to the Singapore's 30 by 30 initiative, uh, encouraging development of this in Singapore and other Southeast Asian countries as well. Now, this is kind of the more novel and kind of the cooler one to talk about in its cell cultured meat. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like, it's lab grown meat. And so how it's done is uh, it's grown in bioreactors. So stem cells are, react are extracted from a living animal. They're then fed into a medium containing amino acids, salt, sugars, signaling molecules, and they, they create muscle, fat, and connective tissues, which are then put into a 3D printer and printed together to combine into meat. If you want to know more about it, there's this really good article um, by these, these individuals that really breaks it down. Um, we're not going to break it down. We're not going to get too technical about it. But Singapore became the first country uh, in the world to allow for the sale and consumption of this lab-grown or cell-cultured grown meat. And it's in the form of this chicken nugget. So um, not only is the market for cell culture meat expected to reach about 140 billion in its net worth by 2030 um, with an added growth of 16%, uh, Singapore has really seen this opportunity and taken advantage of it, um, pushing for companies to develop 
in Singapore, countries like Just Eat Asia, which is a San Francisco-based company with an Asian office, and Shiok Meat, which is a Singapore-based company as well. Um, and they found their place in Singapore, uh, both for a market as well as a environment that allows them to produce it and sell it. Uh, and this food tech advancement really highlights the innovations that Singapore has, has made in the pursuit of its 3 by 30 goals. But what's truly innovative about all of this is the innovation policy that Singapore has done that will allow these novel foods to be not only created, but also sold to the general public. And although like, it seems really cool, the idea of 3D printing meat, uh, what I really wanted to focus on was the innovative nature of the, the policy surrounding this. Because without this, the technology would have no impact, it would have no market. So not only are there in, uh, economic incentives that the Singaporean government is putting to in, attract investors, to attract companies and startups, um, it's also created clear jurisdiction or the regulation of, of these novel foods. And so by the consolidation of their vetting process, not only is it forward thinking and another contributing factor to why Southeast Asia is taking the lead in food tech, um, it really illustrates the multifacets uh, that are needed to address our food uh, world, our world food security goals and how Singapore is taking the lead in that. So in conclusion, um, world hunger is still a serious issue for us and not just people starving, but um, people who are also not receiving proper nutritional value or enough food. And food tech really does appear to be a solution in helping this and in helping us um, advance towards the goals that we have. Especially as we're beginning to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, countries like Singapore are really poised to take the lead in this promising area of tech. There are policies that are allowing for companies like Shoak Meats, Ultimate Nutrition, and Just, uh, Just Eat Asia to develop these and to market these um, really has the potential to shift food security trends back into the black. Um, the money being vested, its, its goals for its 30 by 30 plan are really encouraging this as well. And it's really hopeful for us to be able to get back on track uh, after this pandemic, after this big shock we had to the system into continuing to try to eliminate um, world hunger and uh, minimize the amount of people who are suffering from lack of nutritional need. Um, that's all I have. And uh, if anyone has any questions, you can put those in the chat. Here's, the, here's my references. Great, thanks, Jacob, making me hungry. Um, all right, so let's move into the Q&A discussion um, period now. Um, Caitlin, do you want them to all put questions in the chat or can they raise their hand and speak them out too? Um, whichever is most comfortable for people. If they wanna type their questions out in the chat, especially if they have kind of a complex question, um, okay. feel free to do so. And then if you wanna you know, ask it, in, yeah. um, actually ask it, then you can just do the hand raise function. Okay. So um, questions, any of, questions for any of the speakers or questions that maybe multiple speakers could address um, together are all welcome at this time. And while you all are thinking, I'll take advantage of my, my microphone to start. Maybe um, I would like to ask uh, Jiaxin um, to say a bit more about the extent to which the internet slang and the, or the, what are the, the what, that's not the right word, but the word you used, um, internet speak, net speak is kind of bubbling over into real life, real world um, linguistic kind of expressions. Do you see that happening yet or is it still early? Um, I think you know it's, I mean? ha yeah, I think it's happening, um, already, but there's not too much internet or we see Nespeak already, um, get into our, like the, the real life. Cause, because there's a lot of like linguistic purists and also some other people, they argue that whether this is a correct form, whether we should do that. So uh, there actually, there's a lot of studies about language ideology and language policy. Uh, they tend to um, kind of like investigate the people's, their attitude towards those um, net speak, 
So actually we have a hot debate online, I guess last year. So why some people, they don't use language in a standard way. So they have two groups, groups, of, groups of people. And when, one say that, oh, we should use the standard Chinese. And the other side, oh, that's the, I, I can use language any, uh, in the way that I like. So I think there's some of the, um, internet or the NASPIC has already into our life because some teachers has reported that, oh, some of my um, students, they use some NASPIC in their writing task, and this is not appropriate things, but on the internet, I think that's fine. So, yeah. I have the same experience. My undergraduates use all kinds of things that I never would have been allowed to use when I was a kid, em emojis and things like that. Anyway, thank you. Um, Caitlin, you have a question? Yes, my question is for Jacob. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, it was really interesting and it made me hungry. But um, I have a question about insect-based proteins and the way that they're marketed in places like Singapore versus in the West. Um, I've seen um, products marketed in Western countries, um, specifically the United States and Canada that use um, particularly cricket protein. And usually the way it's marketed is they kind of combine this weird like gimmicky market, like, oh, it's made out of crickets, but they also do overemphasis on the protein content and the health and you know it's environmentally conscious and things like that. Um, and I noticed when you showed the image of the, I think it was the ultimate bar, um, the packaging seemed to be very kind of simple. Um, I couldn't really see any indication that it was made out of crickets um, or even, any indication that it was, you know, particularly good for the for the environment or, um, you know, helpful for food security? It seemed to more or less be like, you know, here's a really good protein bar. Um, so, is there kind of a difference in the way that these these items are kind of marketed to communities in Southeast Asia, specifically Singapore? And is this based on, um, you know, are there I guess are there food traditions in Singapore that have utilized this or similar proteins and that's why they don't really have to market it that way or is it purposefully they don't emphasize the fact that it's made out of crickets um, or is this just a, a strange one-off example? Um, very good question. I think it's kind of twofold. Um, one, I think the difference in marketing, I, you're correct in, in looking at the, the way that they're branding it, that there's a very distinct difference between here, uh, like you said, it's very gimmicky. It's it's kind of like this. It's neat, you know. Let's let's try crickets. It's neat, and look at all these nutritional value. Um, whereas Singapore, it's not. It's it's very much marketed the exact same way as other um, alternate proteins, whether it be like you know a, a mushroom based protein or or anything like that. Um, and I think the cause is um, has to has to do with the, for lack of better words, a foodie culture in Singapore where uh, Southeast Asia specifically, well, not just Southeast Asia, but Asia in general, is already more familiar and comfortable with insect-based proteins uh, than we are in North America. So it's not as big of a jump uh, for, for them as it is to us. Um, in North America, it's abnormal for people to eat insect protein in general. Uh, in, South, in Southeast Asia, Asia in general, it's not. The main hurdle that they're finding is this socioeconomic stigma attached to it, where it's seen as, you know, poor people eat insects. We don't eat insects because we're not, we're a developed country. And their marketing is trying to market it as any other kind of protein bar. Um, so I think that's really where you see the difference in marketing. Um, and, and from surveys, even though they're not necessarily marketing it as um, an economic, be friendly and sustainable, or that's not the main push. Uh, many people in Singapore see it as that. They're, they understand how it is impacting um, their agri-food industry. And uh, I, I don't think they, they see the need to, to brand it specifically like that. Thank you. Other questions for any of the four speakers? I have a question for Solihal and uh, Gali, which is, um, I'm not, I confess to not, I'm not sure I entirely understood the, um, the graphics, 
But it seemed to me that what it was showing was an outsized influence of Pac Khmer. Right, he's much, he's bigger, he's got more connections, he's, he's sort of up there. And so it led me to wonder if, you know, to what extent are we seeing um, digital diplomacy as leading to a new sort of kinds of engagements? Are, are individuals and non-state actors going to become, are already becoming more influential in the way that diplomacy is conducted? Is this, is this a, a broader shift or is it sort of, a, you know, um, one, one piece in uh, one new technique, perhaps in the the way that diplomacy is is conducted. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, um, to that extent, uh, in our, in the GIF visualization, actually there are three uh, three three ways to see how the engagement goes: a direct and a bidirectional and undirected. So, in terms of the Packerman. It's starting from his networks, which means that the connection are starting from its point of view, from his side, from us. Uh, it's a directed, not undirected. So if it's the, the network goes like both ways uh, from, say, from the Mr. President of Indonesia to Packerman, and then the, the connection will be uh, uh, bidirectional. Uh, but it's only starting from the uh, Packerman, it's uh, to goes to the other network. That means only a direct node. So the connection here uh, was built by Packerman, uh, not uh, by the influential actor. But uh, 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 in in Twitter, since that the uh, uh, political uh, political actors can communicate to one and another are now more louder than uh, than uh, they if they may write a, a, a article or something because uh, it uh, the first thing is it's faster so yeah in terms of uh, actors and now uh, in uh, say in in a in a in a, um, uh, uh, institution they have a themes while if it's an uh, uh, state actors like an individual actors it, it, it they it themselves even they have a team but it themselves so it speaks directly to the audiences so they trusted information uh, accurately because we in in our uh, research we consider that uh, Twitter is uh, the primarily uh, resource data while the other resource will be secondary. I hope that answered your question, Captain. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one more question. Jacob. Sorry, I don't know why it wasn't letting me unmute. Um, but I had a question for you as well. Um, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, um, Soleha, about um, your open source uh, gathering. And I wanted to ask if it's appropriate, um, how are you guys going about it? Uh, I know it's been kind of a challenging area for, for a lot of us that focus on you know, social media and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but what have you found useful when you've kind of been trying to go through all this, all this different data, all these different people and all these different tweets? What have you guys found useful in narrowing down um, in finding that actual useful information and useful data. Okay, thank you, Jacob. So uh, uh, it is actually to give information to the, uh, say to the government or to the, to the policymaker that if they are, or they, if they say that they're doing enough for digital diplomacy, but the data shows otherwise, then they, they still need to listen to the data. Even they doing, uh, maybe yes, they're doing still the content and all of that, but are they uh, 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 suitably uh, engaged with the audience? Are they uh, listened by the audience? Are they are there like um, uh, point point on on the objective, or they just posting a content? There'll be different cases. So I think um, many many um, institution. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure in Indonesia or outside of Indonesia. This still uh, misunderstood the concept or how to influence and how to post a content. If they post a content, that does not mean they get engaged. So they still need to understand who to contact with, who to engage with in order to leverage more their uh, connection. So on this part, if they are already engaged with the, uh, the, the, the other actors or the other institution, but 
are they narrating the right uh, narration? So as we are from the Eastern side of the world, we have a strong a storytelling to tell. Are they telling the right story? Are they are there a story are, are, are engaged with the other storyteller? That thing, um, gathering data from, from OSINs, uh, that could give um, a short brief to the uh, policymaker that if they want to leverage more, this is our, the, the step uh, to take, uh, even though they already done uh, enough for their a digital a diplomacy. I have that answer, Jacob. Great, thanks, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, looks like my internet is doing something weird, so I might disappear, but I wanna thank all the speakers. I, should we take a picture? Should we have everyone turn their cameras on and take a little picture of the Zoom? Would that be a good idea? Um, I, turn on your, come on, turn your cameras uh, on, at, sure, least, at yeah. least the speakers. Um, we can use that for, I don't know, for for memory. So I'm gonna yeah. just, I guess we just do print screen. I'm just gonna print screen and let's see if that works. Um, okay, so one, two, three, print screen. All right, thanks everyone. Um, so we'll be, we'll reconvene here at 1230 for the next panel. Meanwhile, go eat yourself some insects or do something uh, to get your, some sustenance into your body. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Clayton and everybody. Um, yeah, so we'll now move into our one Thank hour break you. for lunch. Um, we'll have a Zoom breakout room you can go to if you wish to chat with other conference attendees while you eat. Um, but if not, you can stay in the regular room and just wait for the next panel. Um, and if you need to leave, uh, you may do so. Just make sure that you return promptly because the next panel, Technological Innovation in Asia Part 2, will begin immediately in one hour at 1230. So thank you. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>